All right, so as for today, um, I'm going to be talking about ethics, which is not something I know much about, but I felt like it needed to be in the course. And um, well, this time it's going to be better than last time because we'll have the lecture from Sina as well. But um, I'll just warn you that um, today's lecture is kind of disorganized and I'm just going to dump a bunch of stuff that I have come across over time and uh, hopefully it'll be informative. So definitely um, this kind of stuff has been in the news a lot lately. So the Cambridge Analytica scandal, that was a few years ago now, and there's the there's a Netflix movie about it. And then there's a, another Netflix movie more recently, I guess, The Social Dilemma, um, and all kinds of things in popular media and stuff about eyebrow raising things having to do with the use of technology. And a lot of that technology involves machine learning. Uh, we also saw in the, uh, t the natural language processing lecture a few weeks ago about the word embeddings and how there were kind of biases or stereotypes built into those um, pre-trained models. So uh, part of the problem here is there's so much going on in this nebulous area that I'm going to try to talk about. There's ethics, there's biases, there's fairness, um, there's AI safety, which I'll talk about a bit today, which is related because um, it's different from bias, but if your algorithm doesn't work and it's doing something really important, that is also an ethical issue, although not a bias issue. There's privacy issues. So as I said, I'll just, I'll just say some things and hope hope it's informative. Um, and so starting with bias, um, there, one issue is that models get trained from huge data sets and we don't really know what's going on. So again, we saw those word embeddings that got trained from news articles, I think, in that particular case. Um, there was um, this thing early, oh, you know, this always happens to me. Um, it was this tiny mil 80 million tiny images data set um, and it got retracted um, this year. You can see it's this year. So that was a popular data set and it had, um, it had some bad stuff in the labels, it had some um, toxic, hurtful, biased, inappropriate things in the labels. And part of the problem is, again, um, a lot of times the way these images, these data sets are collected is there's not necessarily a human labeling 100 million images, but they might do something like have some sort of web crawler, do, a, do Google searches and then bring back the results and associate it with that search, or they might crawl all kinds of things and find text or in the natural language processing, they're just crawling a bunch of articles. And so Sometimes the data sets are so big that you don't even know what's in it and it hasn't all been inspected by a human. And other times it is done by a human, but the human themselves has bias issues. So um, here's a paper and I think I put everything in order here. So um, so this, this is from a paper. I should, I'm gonna be putting these on anyways. I should at least include the top so you can see um, who the authors are. So this is a, a paper um, where they show that um, they have a, a neural network meant to classify um, sports things and then they gave it people and it kind of associated different races of people with different sports, be it a basketball or a ping pong ball or a rugby ball. And that's just kind of baked into the model. Um, and that's not what we want. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, one thing that is worth talking about and thinking about, I think, is how could this sort of bias affect people's lives? And uh, I don't know if Sina will have more to say about that on Tuesday, but um, we've, we've talked about this a little bit before, and we've seen the things in the news about resumes, about um, parole, um, but in all kinds of subtle ways, too. I think probably none of us fully understand how this is all affecting our lives and we might not understand it for years. Um, advertisements that are being shown to us, things that are being shown to our children, who really knows. 
Any questions or comments so far? Okay, so yeah, one question is where does the bias come from? And it can come from different places. So it can come from the data in the sense of um, the data collection was just biased. We only got images from these types of sources um, or, or, or we only collected data from, I don't know, people from certain socioeconomic status or whatever. Um, it could come from the labels, the, the Y values. And as I mentioned, uh, those could be kind of web crawled or they could come from humans who are biased. Um, and the bias could come from the learning algorithm itself. I think this is harder to get at, harder to understand. And my impression is a, it's a less common scenario than the other ones. But I should add actually one more. Um, I think actually it's worth adding. It might not even be the machine learning algorithm that's biased, but it is used in a way that is not fair, that is not ethical, that is biased. Um, and so that's another thing we need to watch out for. So um, what I'll show you next is um, some kind of um, so strange results from a, a UBC paper. Um, and this is in terms of uh, AI safety. And by the way, this original chunk of what I'm talking about right now, original chunk of today's lecture used to be in the computer vision lecture. So it's mostly about images and computer vision. And then I rejumbled everything, which might not have been a good idea, but in any case. Um, so this paper is actually from some people at UBC. Um, maybe some of you even took uh, 340 with Ellie Reza. And um, it, it basically takes, uh, so we talked about pre-trained neural networks, change on the image net, net data set, and they just took some other images and tried to have these pre-trained models make predictions, and it was just completely wrong. And what they were saying here is that um, thresh, looking at the probability is not that reliable. So this says Barack Obama is a trench. This says this painting is a chest. Uh, and this says this white noise is a chain link fence. Um, and notice how it's the model's actually very sure of itself. And so we could say, well, we're going to protect ourselves by this is basically a predict proba output, these, these percentages, um, or something like that. Um, and these are these are five different pre-trained um, networks. And <laughs> so what we're saying is um, it might be very confident and very wrong, and that can be a problem too. And that's actually perfectly ties into what we talked about last class, which is this whole business of confidence. The model's confidence should not be your confidence because clearly the model is extremely overconfident here and wrong, which is like the worst possible thing like we talked about on Tuesday. Um, continuing with the idea of AI safety and um, is, it, is it unethical to use machine learning because it's unsafe? Um, so here's, this was, this is, for, for deep learning is a little bit old, but um, I'll show it to you anyways. So that's the, um, so what, what they did here is they took a, a, um, a neural network uh, that was predicting Panda with around 60% confidence, which was correct. And they're adding some imperceptible noise that they engineered the noise intentionally to mess it up. And so here's the new image after they messed with it. It looks completely the same to the human eye. And yet the model is now 99% sure it's a given. And so this, in this particular case, the attackers had access to the code and so they could engineer the noise to really mess it up as much as possible which might not be realistic but this was still kind of a shock to the community in 2015 like wow this image looks exactly the same as this image to a human eye and it's just giving completely different predictions we don't want you know our self-driving car technology to be based on this if it's so fragile, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then people took it further 
and they said, well, actually, forget about messing with the, with the code. I'm going to do a physical attack. Here's a banana, and the, the deep neural network is pretty sure it's a banana. And then I'm literally physically sticking the sticker on the table. So you don't get to mess with the, the you don't, you're not like accessing the code in it exactly. Um, but you're, you're engineering a sticker to be confusing, placing it there and look at that. Now it says uh, very high on toaster and very low on banana. And so kind of the safety concern here is, well, what if some malicious person makes such a sticker, puts it on a stop sign, now a car runs the stop sign and runs into a person. Um, so that's, that's concerning. So is it an ethical issue to put this technology in cars, to put this technology in, I, you know, all the things we use that involve our safety? Um, and I think part of the problem is it's not just do they work, it's well, what if there's a malicious actor like attacking your machine learning system? Can they mess it up? And it seems like they kind of can. Uh, which is pretty scary stuff. Questions or comments about this? So there's um, concerns around fake news and deep fakes and um, advances in machine learning. So you may have heard of deep fakes. They're essentially uh, fake pictures or videos, uh, usually videos. And OK, someone's pasting, a, pasting an article, which is good. I'll check that out later as well. Um, and so I mean, now it's like we're looking at things and we don't even know if they're real. And I say there's definitely some things to think about there ethically. Um, and also, if you are a fan of Game of Thrones, I highly recommend this um, one minute uh, Game of Thrones deep fake, which I found while while digging into this, um, and which I also posted here on the readme for your entertainment. Um, so this was very interesting. Um, Oops, why is it doing that? Don't even know. Oh, well, sorry. I don't know why it's formatting. It's all messed up, but let's just not worry about it. Um, so yeah, the, the, even like environmental impact, is it unethical to do crazy amounts of deep learning because it just uses up a lot of energy? Um, so there's this really interesting paper from 2019 um, that compared CO2 emissions of um, a car used over a lifetime um, versus training one of these fancy neural networks that I've been talking about. And they're saying the emissions are way higher from training one of these NLP models um, compared to using a car um, for, I don't know, a year or a lifetime or whatever. Um, so that's kind of an interesting take as well. And I should mention, when I recommended to you before, hey, you should use these pre-trained models for computer vision for NLP, it's because a lot of work went into them. Like, it's really a lot of work. And there's these massive data centers um, with just like bajillions of air conditioners cooling it down because all the GPUs are worrying. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting take. Um, oh, I see someone, someone, uh, someone started watching the Game of Thrones video. Um, any questions or comments? Are there any detection methods for deep fakes? Um, I'm, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised but um, I haven't looked into it. But yeah, this is gonna be like an ongoing battle for sure. Um, I mean, there's definitely like people trying to detect fake news and 
and yeah, all these kinds of things. I, I'm sure that's being worked on. What did they use to make the electricity to run the GPUs? Well, I guess it depends where they are. Um, okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is um, something from the Calling BS series that I've been mentioning from the University of Washington, which again, I highly recommend. Um, that's on the README as well. And so they have this uh, video and this case study on criminal machine learning, I think pun intended because it's about criminals, but I think they're also not very impressed with the quality of the work. Um, and so basically they have some training data um, that they're criticizing someone else's study, I should say. And so they have some pictures of criminals and some pictures of non-criminals and they were trying to train a computer vision classifier to get from someone's face whether or not they're a criminal. And uh, you can already see there's some concerns here like um, these people are all wearing some kind of suit type thing um, and, and these people are not. And, and yeah, um, there's a lot of reasons to believe that uh, this might not be a, making any sense. Yeah, so someone's writing about frowning. Yeah, the criminals might be less happy in the photos. Um, who knows? So anyway, they were, they were complaining about this. Um, yeah, white shirt and jacket, facial expressions, lighting. Um, and so you have to be, again, one of my goals for you all taking this course is to kind of question your results. Like, okay, so you do this and you get 95% accuracy and don't just like immediately publish a paper being like, well, criminals have different faces than non-criminals. Like, well, what else could be going on here? And um, I mean, we talked quite a bit about feature importances in this course. And in a minute, I'm going to dive into feature importances in more detail, because I think feature importances is a great way to think about it. For example, a lot of a couple times it happened in the course this time and last time someone posts on Piazza, hey, I got 100% test accuracy. What is going on here? And then I'll say, look at your feature importances. And they'll look at their feature importances. And they're like, oh, there's this feature that's really important that is the target that I accidentally left in my X. And they're like, okay, that's why I'm getting 100% accuracy. I need to take the target out and not have it as a feature. So um, looking at feature importances is an awesome diagnostic. Um, and, and maybe that would have been useful here. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe it would find that this region and, and the, the mouth um, are kind of the important parts. I should say for an image, the different features are kind of like the different pixels. So we're used to being feature importance as being like which columns are important, but for an image, it would be more like which pixels, which region of the image is important. That would be kind of the analog. Um, so the, the calling bullshit people though, they actually take it to the next level and they say, well, okay, that's fine. It might be the jackets and this is all just silly. And, you know, this was not a very good paper that they're crit critiquing or whatever, but um, there's other types of problems. Like what if the criminal justice system was biased in the first place, which it probably is in a lot or most places. Um, maybe it tends to convict people of a certain race, people of certain physical characteristics, then the algorithm is going to learn to emulate this. So the algorithm can only learn from the data that you give it. And the data that you give it has come from human history, which is far from perfect. And so it can be very hard to get around this loop. Um, and so, yeah, can we, I think these are really important questions uh, in the field of can, can we, get out of our own loop of bias. Because um, if we're just feeding algorithms historical things and, and we're not so proud of what's been going on historically, then we're not gonna do any better. Um, someone says, but isn't the goal of the algorithm to emulate the actual criminal justice system? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question as well. So If that's your goal, then I guess maybe you're not too worried about this. Uh, I think this presents an opportunity to reflect on the criminal justice system and ask, 
Might our algorithm be doing worse? Might our algorithm be doing better? What can we do? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that is a fair point. Um, it could also be though that, you know, we've started making progress, but our algorithms trained on historical data. And so our algorithm is kind of as tolerant as 30 years ago, because that's when the data is from. And, and that could be a problem too, who knows? Um, how would you detect bias in these cases? Yeah. Um, I don't really know. I mean, it's good that all these, for, for all the I don't knows that I'm saying, um, Sina, if you do know for any of them and you want to talk about them on Tuesday, that would be more than welcome. Um, uh, but no. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I will be talking about many of these things on Tuesday. So okay. uh, if awesome. there are people are so interested in this, then fantastic. We'll talk about them on Tuesday. Just awesome. a quick thing about the issue about uh, whether we want to emulate our uh, criminal justice system. Uh, so that's a very good question and it depends on, uh, as you said, Mike, what it is that we want to do when we use this type of machine learning algorithms. And people generally use them for two types of purposes. One is for automating either all or some aspects of the decision pipeline in criminal justice or policing practices. And in that case, our goal really is not to emulate how things happen there. We, our goal is to make things better. For instance, in many of the states or counties where these algorithms are being used to automate parts of the pipeline, for instance, in uh, predicting recidivism, uh, the aim is to make both more fair and kind of less biased predictions such that we can actually bring the toll down on uh, the prison system, for instance, because previous studies have found that many people, many judges, uh, give very harsh sentences. And actually, if we look at uh, more accurate uh, uh, predictions, we might be able to kind of counter that issue. In practice, that has not happened. And I will talk about uh, uh, next week why that happened. There's a second trend of research uh, that uh, kind of might be more similar to what you have in mind. And people at Stanford, Emma Pearson, Sherrod Gold, and others have done it. And the aim of that research, as Mike has, uh, I think, implicitly maybe mentioned, is to actually study our current practices. So it's, the aim is not to automate parts of it, but study the current biases in our system. So that is more like a scientific practice using uh, machine learning tools to study social systems. And uh, that I strongly suggest looking at that uh, work by Pearson. I think it's in uh, in nature, it's Emma Pearson and some others, it's called the large scale study of policing practices. And, and that shows a positive potential for uh, applied machine learning uh, to kind of reveal biases in our society and kind of take steps to maybe do something better about them. But yeah, this is it for now. <laughs> Thank you, Sina, that was awesome. I'm extra looking forward to your guest lecture on Tuesday. And by the way, if you have references like that, uh, feel free to throw them in the Zoom chat or email them to me and I'll share them with the students after class as optional material and I'd be interested to check them out myself. Uh, there's another question in the chat. What can we do if we see something unethical, unethical in our model? Let's say we parse movie reviews and it gave women a negative coefficient using a linear classifier. Should we throw away the model? Yeah, that's another interesting question. I mean, I guess one kind of middle round is you could throw away the feature and just say, you know, I'm not going to look at this particular feature in making the decisions. Um, but yeah, I guess this is another, uh, I don't know, um, and, and something worth looking into. Oh, here's the, the Nature article coming in from Sina in the chat. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's take a step back here. Uh, but I'm, even if I don't know, I'm still happy that you're asking because I think it's good for everyone to hear these questions. And I think they're great questions and they'll also give me more um, directions to think about in the future as well mm -hmm. for teaching. So how much signal do we expect to get from faces anyway? Yeah, probably not much. So that's another thing. Like even before you start, it just doesn't seem like this project is probably going to work. Um, and so yeah, 90% accuracy. And now we're all well trained to say, well, was the data set in Dallas? What does accuracy mean? But if they have 90% precision and 90% recall, or if the costs are balanced or whatever, 
uh, yeah, then that sounds kind of unreasonable. And like they say in the videos, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And I've been very impressed to see all of you post on Piazza when you're suspicious, like, hey, my test error looks too good to be true. So I've been happy to see you folks being um, critical of your own results, which is great. Okay. Um, so what are some strategies you can do based on what we've learned in the course? You can ask yourself, are my results too good to be true? You can use baselines. You can look at feature importances. You can manually look at some of these. So this is something we haven't done that much of, but um, and maybe I should do more of in the course, but you can find, so for regression, we actually made a scatter plot. I don't know if anyone remembers, but we made a scatter plot of the true house price and the predicted house price. And then like right along, oh, it's mirrored, right along the Y equals X line is like perfect predictions. And we did look at like, are there some cases that were really, really wrong on the scatter plot? And, and looking at the mistakes kind of one by one can sometimes be a useful debugging strategy. Um, try making changes or perturbations. So uh, yeah, it's definitely been embarrassing for me a couple times in my teaching where I just came back later and changed the random seed of my train test split and like all my results were different. And then I realized it was kind of garbage what I was doing. And so that's why I'm pushing now, like use cross validation with lots of folds and even look at the different scores in the folds and the standard deviation, that kind of stuff will guard you against those kinds of issues. Um, and when you're done, think carefully about your confidence, like we talked about last class. So that's kind of some suggestions. Um, as far as ethical and fairness issues, usually, not always, um, the bias is going to come from the data or how the model is used. Um, so think, really think carefully about how the data was collected. And again, I think another kind of general theme I'm trying to give to you here is you, you can't really be working in isolation. You have to be talking to the people who deal with the data. You have to be talking to domain experts if you're not a domain expert. Because if you think about machine learning as someone gives me a bunch of numbers and I give them a number, I don't think that's the right way to think about it most of the time. Um, so yeah, ask how is this going to be used? What decisions are going to be made? Like we talked about, how is this going to affect the world? Um, and, and who might be affected? Just look at the chat. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell writes about uh, machine learning and jailing. I believe Malcolm Gladwell is another Canadian, I believe. So Justin Bieber and Malcolm Gladwell were doing well. Um, talking with strangers. Cool. Thank you for posting that in the chat. Um, any other questions or comments? Neural networks seem to cause most of the problems. Um, neural networks have additional issues, I will say that. Um, but it's a bit, neural networks are a pain, but it's also a bit unfair because neural networks are by far the most common algorithm used for images and images have their own challenges. And we, so some of the blame should go to image data sets rather than neural networks, but I won't disagree with your statement. Um, does the black box nature of neural network influence this issue? Yeah, it does because it's not as convenient to look at things like feature importances and it's hard to understand what the neural network's doing. Like with linear regression, we just get it. Like if the co if we, we did in this class, like you increase the number of bedrooms in the house by one, it increases the prediction of the price by like 5%. But with neural networks, it's just harder to understand what it's doing and that makes everything a little more cloudy and difficult. Uh, this shows the importance of interpretability. Absolutely. How would you measure the absence of bias? Um, I don't know. Um, but I don't, yeah, and I don't know if the article seen and posted is related to that or, or if you'll talk about it. But if not, I think maybe I'll, I'll crawl through the chat after this and, and have kind of a list of questions because um, I think this is really good. Okay, so the next thing is to talk about feature importances for computer vision specifically. So here's another um, article, and I think I got this from 340. Anyways, um, they're trying to understand some heart condition. I think it was an enlarged heart or something. 
and they were using convolutional neural networks on these uh, scans, on these images, and they got good results. Like you could scan someone and you could just like figure out what was going on with their heart. Um, but then it turned out after the fact that the actual scanner image um, had the word portable kind of burned into it if it was a portable scanner at the person's home and not if it was in the hospital. And I don't know if everyone's too young for this, but I mean, back in the day, like when you would take a video with a video camera, sometimes the date and time would be like burned into the bottom of it. And this is kind of the same thing here. And it turns out that the whole thing was kind of garbage. And what, what the neural network was really doing is it had learned to read the word portable. Um, and it had learned that if, if the word portable was there, the person was more likely to have the condition because if they were too sick to go to the hospital, someone would have to come to them, bring the portable scanner, and then they're more likely to be sick. And the whole thing was kind of not picking up on the, the person's heart, but just picking up on something else. And it wasn't really doing what it was supposed to be doing. And so um, the question is, could this have been discovered by looking at feature importances? And I think it can be discovered by looking at feature importances. It's just that feature importances for images have a little bit of a different nature than feature importances for uh, tabular data, which is what we've been doing most of the course. So um, we've used SHAP as our feature importance library in this course. Another one is called LIME. And that one, um, actually, well, yeah, I think LIME is better than SHAP for what I'm about to show you. So um, I didn't plan this originally, so it's not in the course conda environment file. Uh, oops, <laughs> gosh. Um, but if you want to follow along, you'll have to pip install, uh, <laughs> pip install Lime with your environment activated in your terminal. But if you don't want to follow along, that's fine. Um, and so what I have is I've just copy and pasted the code from a few weeks ago that I already showed you with the pre-trained network. Um, so you all remember this silly picture of me um, and we had a model saying it was a bow tie from a few weeks ago with 99% confidence. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use Lime and ask it to explain that prediction. So why did you say it was a bow tie? And this is very similar to SHAP. So we use SHAP and with SHAP, we could go to a particular prediction and say, why did you make that? prediction and we made those plots, uh, which was really cool, rather than just like generally which features are important, which are not important. Um, and so this takes about a minute to run, so it'll be done soon. Um, so I'm using Lime to ask it, hey, why did you say this thing is a bow tie? And what it's going to do is it's going to tell us which parts of the image, which pixels, which regions made it think this was a bow tie, and it's going to color green for the very bow tie positive parts of the image and color red for the kind of anti bow tie parts of the image. So we'll just wait for that to finish. Um, should be done soon. Better get myself one of those new M1 MacBooks if I want this to go faster. There we go. Okay. And so here's what it came up with. Um, so this is pretty cool because it basically colored green on the bow tie. Um, and it was like, hey, this is the part of the image that made me say this was a bow tie. And you can imagine here, um, I don't remember if they actually did it or, or not below in this article, but if you imagine you were like, why are you saying this person has an enlarged heart? And it was like, uh, you know, here, oh, I guess it should be green. This is why I said they had an enlarged heart. Then um, you might say, oh, that's not really what I was expecting. Let me think about that uh, a little more carefully. Um, someone posted in the chat, it takes longer to render the explanation than it does to make the prediction. Yeah, um, and that was true with SHAP as well, by the way, like those random forests and stuff were making predictions super fast but SHAP was taking a long time. So 
um, that that's all that's all good. I mean, the training takes longer, but we're not actually training this network. We're using a pre-trained network. I will say, as kind of an aside, you can see the image is kind of like washed out. Um, this was like an incredibly frustrating hour or more um, yesterday that I was trying to get this to work. Um, and whatever, it's not really important for our purposes in this course, but I'm using a different um, pre-trained neural network than the one in the Lime tutorial, and it uses a different kind of pre-processing, and I can't like, I wasn't able to get it to work, um, but oh well. What was I gonna say? Oh well, I don't remember. Um, any questions about this? Well, I guess one thing I was gonna say is I wasn't super like, the Lime thing wasn't that seamless as I thought. So for example, it gave pretty different results every time, which is why I had to set the random seed and apparently if you set this num samples to a bigger number, then it's kind of less random, but it was already quite slow, even with a thousand. So um, I don't want to advertise this as like the easiest thing ever to use because I actually found it quite hard to use, but, um, but very worthwhile if you're doing this kind of thing, I would say. So then we had the kind of silly prison situation. Um, in which it predicted that my office picture was a prison. So I was actually super curious about this. Like this was going to be the big payoff for me that I was going to get it to tell me what part of the image um, made it predict this to be a prison. Um, but it was just kind of a disaster. I mean, it's running now and you'll see in a minute, but I, I couldn't really get it to, to make any sense of what it was outputting. Um, so I uh, don't know. I, I think I sunk enough time into this, but um, if anyone figures it out, you can let me know. Um, yeah, it was, it, the problem is it's just so finicky. It was giving me different results, different times, and the pre-processing had to be just right. And, um, well, you'll see in a second, but it was a bit hard to interpret the output. But I guess there, I mean, there, I was thinking there was even these kind of like bars on the windows, not on my window, but like on the windows outside of, I, I, who, who knows? Who knows? But I'd be very curious. Uh, so we can just wait for this to finish. Um, and then we can take our break. And we're right on schedule, which is, which is great news. I'm happy about that. Um, just give it a few more seconds. Any, any questions or comments in the meantime? No, there we go. Yeah, so I, I, I just, it, I don't get it. It was supposed to be red and green, but it turned out to be this big mess. Um, so yeah, oh well. But I am very curious. Um, okay, so that is that. Um, we're gonna take a five minute break now.